Hi, Charles. How are you? Hi, Ilya. I'm good. How are you? Perfect. Thank you so much. Let me start with a very silly question for you, I have. How do you enjoy having your double name? It's really unique, I, I, I feel. So it's, uh, it's absolutely not unique in that um, in Quebec, where I'm from, in the French part of Canada. Uh, people born in the 80s, 90s, a lot of us, uh, a lot of the parents uh, gave their children both last names from the mother and the father. So people think my first name is Charles Richard, but it's not. My first name is only Charles or Charles. And I have two last names. If you look at the dash carefully, it's between Richard and Amelin. So I have two last names, like a lot of people here of my age, uh, my generation. Uh, mm. Similarly to the more Spanish people who tend to have two last names like that. Uh, so, uh, so yes, it's a simple, uh, simple answer. The only confusing thing is because there's another uh, much greater pianist called Marc André Amelin, and his hyphenated uh, name is in the first name, Marc André, and then one last name. So I think that's probably why people are confused uh, a lot of the time. <laughs> and and I, be, I believe also many people think that you are guys relatives. I know that the answer, but I still have to ask this question. Are you relative? No, we are not. Uh, maybe if we go back 300 years or so, the first uh, Amelin who came from France uh, to, to Quebec. But uh, no, we're not, but we're uh, very good friends. And even this summer, we played together for the very first time. And that was very exciting. Yeah. That was my, my, my next question, because I discovered I was browsing um, Medici and, and YouTube and then I stumbled across your recording of Mozart. So to me, Mark Andrea Amen is one of my biggest inspiration because I, uh, since I discovered his recordings years ago, I think for the first time in 2004, I discovered his Gadowski um, recording, you, you, you know, of course. And um, yes, yeah, to me, it's one of the uh, iconic pianists. How it feels uh, to collaborate with such a great musician? And uh, tell me about your experience with Mark Andre. Well, I, you know, he, he has all the reasons in the world to be, uh, you know, uh, very, uh, I guess, pretentious because of all he has achieved and all he can do on the piano and as a composer as well, but he's not. He's the simplest, most humble. And in my experience, all the greatest artists that I've met uh, tend to be the most humble and, and simple, easy people to talk to. So no, it was a very simple process to, we played Mozart to piano sonata and the two piano concerto, and it was very simple, very easy and very fun to work together. Uh, we didn't have to talk too much, you know, we just let, uh, and it connected very quickly. and. Uh, yeah, I like yourself. I've been a longtime fan, and I discovered a lot of repertoire through because of him. You know, like Metner's music, mm -hmm. uh, Scrabin, even all the sonatas, uh, and then Alcan and Capustin, and you know, the list is so long of composers that he's really put out there, and that he was one of the one of the first to to play them and record them, and maybe maybe the only one who is able to do it so well. You know, it's like it's. I mean, Godovsky or Alcan is nearly unplayable, but for someone like him, it seems uh, manageable. Yeah. yeah, I was I was going to ask you <laughs> because you you had a chance to collaborate with him. Is is a real human? Uh, because when when I, when I look yeah. at at the list of his recordings and uh, and uh, their repertoire, I have no idea how it's possible. And what do you think about this? Is a he is human. He has a superhuman ability. I think in uh, in uh, his way of uh, learning music, I find. Uh, you know, this is one of his latest recordings is the first six uh, Feinberg sonatas, Samuel Feinberg. This very uh, this great Russian pianist, also mm -hmm. a composer. And if you should all listen to his uh, recording of the third sonata, he has a live performance from Russia from a few years ago, uh, and someone that's put the score. You can follow it, and it's <laughs> it's just. A, it's hard to imagine learning this piece. And this is just one of his 80 something recordings he's done over the course of his career and he's still doing a lot. I think his next one is with, with Faure's music. So that's, mm -hmm. uh, no, it's, it's, so it was a great honor to share the stage with him. Did you to feel... finally clarify that we're, <laughs> officialize that we're not related. <laughs> yeah, good. Uh, did you feel nervous at all? Well, yes, I mean, 
because of many different reasons, it was in La Nozière. Uh, it was a beautiful day out. And as you can see in the video, there was about 3,500 people. So a lot of people came. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, you want to do well in front of your one of your heroes. Uh, but it made me feel, feel at ease uh, right away. And uh, no, we had a, it was a really, actually a really great, a lot of fun, this concert. Uh, one of my highlights of the summer, for sure. It seems like one of the recordings is, is fantastic. The question, the, the rehearsing process, how do you feel and how do you manage? Because I know that you both have very limited time. So how many rehearsals you, you basically had to, to put things together? Oh, well, I think we had something like two rehearsals just by ourselves to do the mostly the sonata and then a little bit of the concerto without the orchestra. And with the orchestra, we had one rehearsal and one dress rehearsal uh, the day off. So, but I think the whole thing maybe happened over the course of two days, really, I think, mm -hmm. maybe three days. Uh, so yeah, it's very quick. Quick. It's yeah. almost like that with orchestra. It's always one rehearsal, dress and concert, usually. Uh, Rarely do we get more than that, and I'll get maybe a little more than that soon because I'm doing a new recording with uh, Les Violons du Roi in Quebec. Of uh, we did a Mozart CD a few years ago, and we're doing another one now. So, uh, uh, so yeah, maybe when you do a recording, there's a little more time, but uh, mm. no, it's uh, it's not it's it's, it's pretty expensive, huh? the orchestras and such. So uh, yeah, you know, time time is uh, money. <laughs> we will we'll, we'll talk about your recordings for sure because I have many questions. Um, as we also work now on, on a few projects and I will definitely need your advice. You mentioned your your hometown, your uh, city, province of, of Quebec is, uh, if I understand, is not very far from Montreal, uh, but but probably far enough to, to be a little bit uh, in the shade of the cultural life. So I wanted to share your, uh, your memories from, from your childhood and um, yeah, maybe tell about your um, life in the city, the cultural environment in general, and your, of course, your first uh, music classes. Sure, I grew up in Joliette, uh, Quebec, and this is where actually I played with Marc Andre this summer. So the Festival de Lanazar is held in that uh, city, which is about an hour away from Montreal, um, and it's a rather small city, um, maybe 30,000, 40,000, I'm not mm -hmm. sure. Uh, but what's special about this area in Quebec is that uh, there were very important figures that put classical music on the map. So uh, Father Fernand Linze was one of them, and he founded the festival and this summer music camp. And there was a youth competition. So it was actually, for such a small place, a lot of activity around musical education and classical music. So I was very lucky, actually, to have been born there. Also coming from a rather, you know, poor to middle class family. Uh, if I was in the States, for instance, I don't think I would have, a have access to lessons and things like that. So, um, so yes, I'm very grateful that I was born there and that I met also. So my father was the worst, first one to teach me for about six months. He was a self-taught pianist, you know, amateur pianist. And he saw I had a few, uh, a bit of talent, you know. Uh, so yeah, from age five to 18, I had the same teacher in Joliet actually, uh, Paul Sudulescu of R Romanian descent. Uh, so the, I learned everything. I guess 80% of what I know I learned with him. And then all the 20% I learned with all the other teachers I've had throughout, throughout my career, my life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 13 years is definitely a decent time. What do you think? Uh, what's the ideal time to spend with one teacher? To your, to your mm -hmm. sense, to your feeling? That's a good question. I would say uh, if it's if it works, don't you don't you don't have to change necessarily. You know, changing for the sake of changing is no good. But if you see that there's no progress being made, or you know, that's a good reason. But I think most importantly is not maybe the teacher that you need to change, but the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, so going from a small town to Montreal was a big shock. You know, when I first went to McGill and then. Miguel to the States, when I went to Yale, there was another big shock and to be exposed to the talent of others, you know, I usually, you know, by the time I finished in my hometown, I was sort of the best there. But when I went to Montreal, I was, oh, I was not the best anymore. Uh, and by the end of Miguel, my time in Miguel, I was amongst the, the best pianists around, you know, winning competitions and stuff like that. And then when I went to Yale, again, not the <laughs> far from being the best over there. So. I think that's more important maybe than changing teachers is, is uh, 
making sure that you're never like the best uh, pianist around you know mm -hmm. <laughs> so that you can always be inspired and and a little competition is not bad you know it's healthy i think yeah it's, it's, it's very wise advice thank you um going back to your your childhood to your first music classes um i'm i'm teaching a lot currently mm -hmm. and uh it's you're always checking whenever you you receive a new student anyhow you start to compare his abilities to your own abilities when you were in his age so can you approximately estimate your musical abilities in the age of five when, when, when you just began your music journeys well i think i was fairly uh, talented um, in that i could get away with some good results with very little work and uh, my teacher and parents didn't exploit that and if i had parents who were more pushy and saw my potential I, I'm afraid I would have burned out and they would make me practice. They would have made me practice way too much and I would be like this unhappy adult, I think, today. So so I think what's I kept saying, I keep saying to, to children and to the parents of very talented children that it's important to have a life around music and it's important to have time to waste. You know, not every hour should be filled in your day of, with practicing, with studying, with, you know, so. Uh, so I think. Uh, I think I could have made bigger results. I mean, because honestly, I people have started to know about me only after the Chopin competition when I was 26, f fairly late, you know, compared to others who start very young, you know. Uh, so I'm a late bloomer in that sense. But uh, that's because uh, my parents and my teacher just make sure I, I, I had enough of a challenge and enough difficult, you know, music. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm jumping around, but I think another essential thing is that you should always, when you're a student, you should always always play music that's just a little uh, uh, challenging so that you can play it well. Because I see too many times pe young people playing, like 11 years old, playing Chopin concertos really so badly. But they can play it, but it sounds terrible. And I don't think you can learn how to become a great pianist by playing terribly, you know. So it's much better if you're 11 and very gifted to be playing I don't know, you know, like a, a um, some Clementi or, or Kabelevsky or or whatever, mm -hmm. but or Debussy, you know, small Debussy pieces, but play play it really really well, you see, and learn music like that. So I, I I'm happy that that was the, the sort of the philosophy of my teacher. Mm -hmm. Beside your learning abilities, so observe uh, information to keep it in, in 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 your in your mind and and follow instructions. Please understand, but speaking of um, listening abilities, memory or uh, perfect pitch or um, so anything uh, uh, particularly you would highlight? Well, perfect pitch is uh, my father discovered uh, when I was seven that I had it. I thought by when I was a kid, I thought everybody knew what a C and a D was, you know, but I guess it's a more exceptional thing. So it's very useful for memory, of course. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, yeah I, I think the, my gifts were, I think I was musical from the get-go, you know. I also, my teacher didn't make me do scales and arpeggios and anything like that. Actually, I only did Anno exercises a little bit, but even those, he made me do it musically, you know, changing articulation and different hands, different nuances to develop, you know, independence of the, of the hands and... Um, uh, so when I see students doing like half of their practicing is, is dedicated to skills and things like that, and the other half to music, it's like to me there's no there's nothing separating both. You know, you should always always, always practice. You know, something and it's 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 uh, it's opposite. Like you should always practice te technical passages musically and musical passages technically. You know, mm -hmm. uh, so. Uh, yeah, I don't, I can I don't personally understand the, and it must be so boring to do scales and scales endlessly. And I can play Mozart piano concertos fine, and there's a lot of scales in those, you know. I think you can learn those by, in the music and find exercises within, uh, so you keep it, you know, uh, relevant to, to your, the piece you're doing. I totally understand what you're saying. Um, I would maybe only add on top of this that 
um, to shape the scales to, to play them musically, it's also kind of a habit. Sometimes it, it happens naturally that just five years old or six years old uh, uh, boy or girl, they have this natural sense of shaping. But to, to be honest, I never, I never seen anybody like that before. Usually it's something what is taught, need to be taught and also raised uh, by teachers, by parents. And very often it's related to, uh, to music which surrounds you um, so I would like you to share your first musical impressions, maybe recordings or some, 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 some great musicians say that they, they were listening to TV shows and they, they, they can, you know, um, just repeat the music from the, from the uh, cartoons or TV. What were your first musical impressions? Oh, well, I remember uh, uh, my first recordings that really, uh... I guess really shocked me or inspired me was um, Timmerman's uh, Chopin Ballade, uh, his famous uh, DG recording of the eighties, and that, uh, yeah, that I really become obsessed with with uh, with that CD, yeah. and uh, from an early age, from maybe when I was eleven or so. But to be honest, I was not listening to classical music um, very much until I was a teen. I was a kid like any other kid, you know, listening to popular music and playing video games and stuff like that. And so I guess the, the real passion for it came a bit later when I studied, you know, in my late teens and university and and also fell in love with the act of practicing, but also fell in love with the repertoire and not just the piano repertoire, but discovering, especially when I went to Yale, being a lot more interested in the opera and the string quartets, symphonies. So really expanding my knowledge uh, of the of classical music, which is essential. Uh, eventually, if you want to do, you want to play well, but Mozart, you, gotta, you have to know the operas. If you want to play Beethoven, you have to know the string quartets. If you want to play Brahms, you have to know his orchestral works and so on and so on. Yeah. If you want, I, I will share you how, uh, how we got to know about you and uh, how we got to know you, because we, we studied at the same school, if you remember. Um, and the rumors spread very quickly that Char, Char is about to come to the city from, from Yale, right? Because you were, you were coming to Montreal Conservatory after the Yale. So we already knew, okay, he's coming, but I had no idea how, how you look like. And I remember vividly that Daria and I, we, we walked down this, the Henri Julien street and, and people were saying, you know what, he, he, looks, he looks very, very similar like leon flasher i remember this somebody somebody said he looks very like a leon flasher i was like okay, okay okay and then we were walking down the street and i saw a young leon flasher you know in the in these headphones or these are similar headphones i remember this and i told uh, dari i said that guy is listening to music i had no idea what kind of music you, you you're listening to maybe it was not non-classical stuff but it was obviously that you are staying in music in and out the conservatory by the way what you were listening to <laughs> so i have no idea could have been anything really i listened to so many different things uh but it's funny you say that i if you look actually i never had that uh, comparison but i'm I mean, such a big fan of len fleischer so i take it uh is Brahms concerto recordings with Cleveland and Joselle, I think are the very best that were ever done for these pieces. Um, but uh, actually, I, if you look at Gary Olson from the Chopin competition days in 1970, that is, uh, I think, even more <laughs> like, like well, likeness. You, know, so you said, you said oh. that, uh, that, that Montreal uh, literally changed your, your, your life and, and your uh, musical life, first of all, and maybe personally too. How was your life in, in, in Montreal back then? Well, I live with my mother who moved to Montreal uh, for me and my brother when we went to university. And um, um, I, would, I have to say I was quite introspective and it's it always takes me a while to, to find new friends and things like that. So when I moved to Montreal, I, I, I knew only the little spot around Miguel and the little spot around my mom and mother's house, but I was not curious to know more about the city or anything. Um, 
So I guess it took, I, I, I fell in love. I realized what great, great, great city Montreal is when I came back from the States or, you know, when I, when that's, that's when, when I met you, I think coming back from Yale and my, uh, you know, around 24, 25 years old and, you know, going to shows and the festivals in the summertime. And so, yeah, I think by then I, I really was happy and grateful to be living there and it's interestingly enough now you know i'm 33 i've traveled the world quite a bit and i still it i still don't don't want to live anywhere else you know i think we we uh vancouver is pretty nice too but uh, mm -hmm. i have a thing it just feels like home to me and uh it's also such a specific thing you know the, the language also that uh, that i speak you know it's uh it's it's spoken like that this only here you know like if I go to France, I have an accent. If I go anywhere in the world, I have an accent. But uh, back home, I, I'm, at, I'm home, you know. Yes. Um, so you said that after Montreal, you went to Yale. I'm dying to know more, more uh, insights of your studying with uh, um, Professor uh, Berman, uh, because he's definitely one of the iconic uh, teachers. And uh, how do you feel? Uh, I, I bet the environment was, was very competitive and uh, electrified uh, the talented people. So how it was? Well, it was not my natural choice to go there, but so... By, what do by you mean? Sorry. Finished, Sorry, well, what do you by mean? The time I, by the time I finished uh, Miguel, my first plan was to stay at Montreal and study with Mar Marc Durand in those days, mm. in, you know, in Montreal. And Sarah Lehman, who was my teacher in my final year at McGill, she basically said, well, you should go out, you know, you should, you should uh, go out of the city and live other experiences. And I really didn't want to, you know, I had my friends, my girlfriend, my family, my comfortable life there. But she said, and she's very really smart, Sarah, and she said, you know, you yell, you could go there, it's free for everyone who, who get, gets accepted, but it's very competitive. I don't know if you'll get through. So you get accepted so by putting it as a challenge you know it's like oh sure i'll go audition and i'll get the, i'll get the, the thing so i think she was smart to uh, sort of push me in that way and uh i i act was accepted and those are one of the big reasons because i don't have the money or my family doesn't have any money for me to go to juilliard or something without a full scholarship so so it made a lot of sense to go to yale and i i was familiar with boris berman only through his recordings uh mostly of prokofiev of course mm -hmm. But I, you know, was enjoying those recordings a lot. So my time at Yale was rather, it was really good. Again, it was a big shock to be, to be alone there. Um, but of, after a few months, I, I met a lot of good friends. A good friend that I met there was now a Montrealer. I don't know if you know that, uh, Henry Kramer. Yes. He yes just he's, 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 he's just joined uh, the, the montreal uh university recently right it's, it's like a colleague yeah. of mine now so yeah, yeah. it's very it's just great that we are we're both there and um uh, and yeah so the lessons with berman were, were very interesting very uh it was very severe in a way but very good with uh he saw i think when i came in that i was very confident but i was lacking a lot of things in my playing but uh, i got away with good results because of maybe my confidence or my music you know my musicality but i was not thinking about what i was doing enough mm. and so he was very good with uh, sort of breaking me down in a way and just making me consider everything and uh, i practiced a lot when i was at yale that's I, I developed a very good ethic of practicing which i still use today because uh, you couldn't waste time with him you know like if he he says what you're playing next week i, I think early on i was like i'm gonna start schumann zumaresk and he was okay. Can you play it next week? It's a thirty-minute piece, so you have to play at least 50, the, half, the first half of it from memory in a week, which is that's a lot. You know, for me, I was not used to to learn music like that so quickly, uh, and that actually is very useful skill to know because now that I'm a professional, so many times I've had to learn music on the go, really, really fast, and so uh, so it's a skill I still use today quite a lot. You know. Uh, yeah uh, is anything in his teaching style was amazing you like in particularly or maybe annoying i don't know <laughs> uh I, I it was very uh I, it was very good humored i know he has a very good sense of humor so sometimes uh, i remember those 
Um, but I especially remember very good lessons with Brahms music. Especially I was sort of discovering more and more Brahms and his chamber music. I played a lot of chamber music there. Uh, so and and I also played some uh, late scrabin for him, and I remember those lessons very fondly. I cannot say in detail exactly, but just the evocations, the image, and the uh, the uh, the just he, he knew how to use the you know the exact right words to explain certain things in that very specific style, which is the, you know the vers la flamme or the tenth sonata, that kind of music. Uh, he's also quite knowledgeable with that music. He's recorded all the sonatas. Yeah. Scrabbing, so, mm -hmm. uh, but the school as a whole was really uh, great for that. I got to do a very high level chamber music, you know, uh, which was I I hope more, you know people get to do that, you know, because you learn so much, so much, you know, uh, by doing that. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, no, it's, it's a very good time. But uh, uh, you know, I don't the states. Uh, I wouldn't live in the States, so I was happy to come back to yeah. to Quebec and Canada. Yeah. Uh, two questions. Um, the first one is you, you mentioned that you have uh, established a new, new way of practicing. Could you please share what it was? And you said you, you still you use it till today. Well, I think I used to leave memorization to the very end, you know. And now it seems when, like these days I'm being working a lot on Prokofiev second concerto. I'm playing for the first time next year mm -hmm. uh, with the Montreal Symphony and uh, in May. So I have still a, still a few months, but uh, the work has to be now, as you know, <laughs> with a piece like that. And I've been uh, actually doing everything a little at once, you know, being certain, even while learning the piece, I'm, I'm starting to memorize it. And it forces me to understand how the music is made, you know, because if you just play and play, at some point, your finger will memorize the movements. But you you may not spend the actual time understanding the composer's choices and why is it built that way. You know? And by memorizing at the, at the same time as learning it, then it forces you to think like the composer, to make connections, you know, between parts. And and I I do put a lot of fingerings in everything I do. It's a lot more even when I do chamber music, which I know I'll be doing with the score. Uh, but yeah, putting fingerings down is. Uh, is only honestly it's about 75 percent of the work especially in prokofiev you know uh maybe in mozart there's a you know after you learn the piece uh the real work starts you know but in prokofiev you know just getting the notes down is a, it's a big part of it it's, it's probably the most amazing uh, uh thing when you open any scores by gadowski right you see mm. that every single note has mm. has its finger sometimes two or three options on top. Oh, you mean his work work copies or his published works? Just, just his, his published, everything, what, what he was publishing. Okay, uh, there's a lot of fingerings, you're right, yeah. It's, it's, it's mm -hmm. fantastic. Met Metner, I've played some Metner and there's a lot of fingerings which are so good. Yes, and his music is, is very pianistic, I find. Exactly, very super pianistic. Yeah. Designed for huge hands, though. I have to admit some of, some of oh, his, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, yeah some, some of his positions, they, 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 I have bigger hand than, than Daria has. And when yeah. we approach the same piece, uh, for me, they fit. For her, that it doesn't fit. So, so it's, uh, yeah. I see. You said that after Yale, you you came back to Montreal City. But how did Montreal Conservatory look to you after Yale? Well, basically, uh, my plan was to start doing international competitions, which I've never done before the age of twenty-four, which seems fairly late, <laughs> you know. Uh, <laughs> because most people you know start at 16 you know those who really want to make it you know so that was i set myself that as a goal okay i'm 24 i have six years left if i want to do those kinds of competitions and i thought a very good teacher would be andre laplante himself being one of the great uh, first canadian champions in competitions winning the second prize in tchaikovsky 78 uh, and being an absolute fan of his recordings. I really think his recordings are among the very best uh, of an, of Ravel and Liszt, especially and Brahms. They're just I haven't. I think it's, the Liszt sonata cannot be better than what he's done with it, really, or the Ravel Miroir for that matter. So, um, so yes, I, I knew him a little bit from Arford and things like that, but I uh, I wanted to study with him, and that was really a way a, a great thing. Uh, 
he opened me up, I think, to really trust myself. You know, like I said, in, in Yale, I, I was a bit too cerebral by the end of it. You know, Boris Berman really made me think and analyze things. And, but I lost maybe touch with something uh, that I had, you know, inside me, this, uh, this just, uh, I guess, innate uh, passion, maybe that was a little gone, you know, thinking mm -hmm. a little too much. And I think André was very good with finding all my, my, my own voice back and, and how to sustain a line. And so, so yeah, he was a fantastic teacher for me and really good to coach me for the competitions I, I did. So in Conservatoire, yeah, that was basically it. I did only mostly just lessons with André and, and practicing a lot. And, and thankfully, I didn't have to do a lot of competitions. I, I applied to a lot of them, actually got refused to a lot of them, you know, and the first one I got accepted finally was in Korea in Seoul. And I and I did well over there with the third prize. Then a few months after in Montreal with the second prize. And then those successes convinced me, OK, maybe I have a shot at the, the Warsaw. The Chopin. And uh, I did it and I'm very glad I did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're all glad <laughs> you did <you laughs> not only for uh, for becoming a, a first Canadian who who got so, as, as high as, as you did in this particular competition, but also uh, by your 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 way of playing. You remember we were chatting uh, after each round. I was uh, sharing with you like my um, um, impressions on on your playing because I was very grateful that. Um, some something what we discuss the students here in, in, in class and you have to convince them and you have to explain that yes you have to sing on the on the piano you need to really you know um, and then there is a guy just coming on the stage and you did everything so beautifully and so confidently um, so I, I thank you for for your participation i'm very happy that it, it turned out to you know to be a great thing great step in uh, stage in, in your life um, since you started talking about Chopin competition, I can't uh, avoid asking you, um, I bet it was stressful, but can you please uh, maybe remember the most, a few, the most memorable and great things about Chopin competition, what, which happened to you? Oh, <laughs> it's, it's almost seven years ago now. It's crazy. That time, time goes by. Um... Well, I think I was most nervous, uh, to be honest, was at, uh, I remember, so I went to Warsaw first in April of 2015, five months before the competition for the preliminary round. Mm -hmm. And I was in the chamber hall of the Warsaw Philharmonic. And you can find that clip on YouTube still. Uh, and somehow I was more nervous there than anything I did at the actual competition. I don't know why, just because, uh, you, you know, uh, playing there for the first time, maybe. And then you had to play etudes for that round too. Mm -hmm. uh, three of them, I believe, or yeah, three, three etudes, including like winter wind, you know, something very difficult. And when I found that I got uh, through, I was so excited just to be part of an event like this. Um, so I think that's, that's what saved me from being too nervous. I, of course, I was, I prepared tremendously the, in the months before and I was very lucky because I got to play a lot of sort of stressful professional concerts around Quebec because of my prize the year before in Montreal. Mm -hmm. So in Arford, I'm in Forge, different series here and there. I was able to do Chopin recitals in, in a stressful way, you know, with a paying audience and everything. And I think that gave me an advantage over certain students who only got to play for the teachers or studio class. And they're they're on the stage in the Warsaw Field with cameras everywhere, with Mart Argerich listening, and and that's maybe too much of a shock. And I sort of had a little like step to it, you know, uh, thanks to that. So, but there's nothing that can prepare you when you when you go on that legendary stage and you have to play. Uh, yeah, so I, I I it's very corny, but I did feel like something in the air with that competition that made me uplifting, lifting me. You know, some things I. I, I listened, uh, I don't listen a lot to those videos, but certain moments I remember like being almost like uh, falling apart, but somehow the piano, the, it was, the piano was so good, the Yamaha CFX and somehow just the, the, the this, I don't think it's the spirit of Chopin, but just the spirit of the, 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 the place and 
it's such a a great thing you know this competition and everyone talking about it and shopping being celebrated like that just it, it gives it made me play at my best uh, for certain moments for sure uh like the sonata or uh, what's uh, the rondo and the, the polonaise so, so I, I really really remember uh, and certain things i can't i can't even repeat like i'm never gonna play this the finale of the sonata like that you know <laughs> <laughs> it's just at this cr crazy speed but somehow it worked and uh, so yeah no it's a it, it was a very positive experience the whole time basically yeah so. how did you how did you feel getting recognition by uh christian zimmerman for your sonata because you you got you got a prize you got a award from him for for the best. Well, I, actually, the prize is um, so the jury is, is selecting those uh, the prize. Oh, but the money is given by Christian Zimmerman. Okay. See. So uh, so it's it's not his choice. But I didn't I, I did meet him later when we toured the, all the Chopin competition laureates in Japan. He was there actually at the same time, and he. Thank God he didn't say he was going to be there when we played, but he came to see us after the show, the gala concert, and I, I was able to meet him. But yeah, that was someone meeting him and meet Argerich, those kind of people too. Mm -hmm. um, I just wish um, I, I was I, I I listened to Radulupu in concert four times, but I never got to meet him. Mm -hmm. and that's one of my big regrets now, because even though he's not a Chopin Chopinist at all is my biggest uh, inspiration uh, you know each concert i've heard from him was life-changing and uh, i used to say he's my thing living pianist i cannot say that anymore but uh, alive or dead is, is still uh, to me uh, one of the very uh, the very best there is mm. speaking of the chapin competition so right after you probably got uh engagements and the the last for for, for, for some time and Recently, we've got a new edition and the new winners, of course, and they then how the management of um, how do you feel that the, the, the difference in treating you as an artist there, like then when when you just recently uh, won your prize and now like after five, uh, six uh, years. Well, well, it's a good question. So basically, when you win a thing like this, if you're well surrounded by managers and labels and such, but, uh, you'll get a lot of concerts. And the real work starts there, because you have to play well. <laughs> yeah. And you have to learn a lot of new rep. And, uh, you know, now, my career is, is a lot of it is uh, reinvitations today, you know, seven years after that, a lot of places I'm playing like the Vancouver, for instance, the Vancouver Chopin Recital Society is going to be a third time. Mm -hmm. So when you win a competition like that, you you get invited a lot of places. But if they don't like you, if 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 uh, you're not prepared, if something happens, they won't they, you know won't have you back. So I'm lucky that in that there's enough places across the world, you know, symphony orchestras, Chopin societies, some festivals, and certain countries I play more that keep having me back. Uh, you know after one year after two years uh so so that's what i so of course the iron is not as as hot as it was the first year of the competition and i'm very glad that it is the case for bruce now he's getting bruce liu of course who is getting all the attention deser deservedly so um but uh yeah the the the, the i think it's it's a great thing to be able to have that to have had that opportunity to present yourself for the first time to a different audience somewhere. And if the, if it's a success, if they like you, then you can build on that. And so a lot of the concerts that I do, maybe, so the first year or two after the competition, I had something like 80, 90 concerts a year, something crazy like that. And now it's m maybe more around 60 or so. 2020, of course, with the pandemic, it's been uh, mm -hmm. hard to say, but this year, 2022, I think it's gonna be around 60, 65. Which is uh, I'm very happy with that number. No. Yeah, it's, it's it's pretty it's pretty uh, intense schedule. I have to admit. Uh, yeah, and, yeah, and yeah, and uh, and sorry, but uh, this year especially with the pandemic, there's so many things that were cancelled and then you know replanned, and I had to step in sometimes for some people. So I ended up this year playing eleven different concertos, mm -hmm. and I had to learn five new ones. And that's that's something I would do again. It was <laughs> just an insane amount of work. Yeah. 
uh, so at my level i unfortunately you kind of have to do that but if you're someone like kissing or Zimmerman or sokolov you can basically you know say i'm playing this concerto and this recital for an entire year and no matter where you go they'll they'll, they'll, mm. they'll do that for you but in my level you have to have a lot more flexibility in different repertoire and mm -hmm. things like that so mm. yeah. uh I, I i have to ask you the recent success of Canadian performance of the last two recent two editions of Chopin competition. Is it new? Is it a new trend or a coincidence? Oh, well, I mean, I don't think it's a coincidence. I mean, uh, the, the piano uh, tradition in, in Canada is very, very strong, especially if the, the one I know more is the one in Eastern Canada, so Toronto, Montreal, and uh, so I mean, Shayu or sorry, Bruce, Bruce and myself were mainly formed in you know institutions in Montreal or in Quebec in Canada. So uh, I think we can pat ourselves on the back collectively. I think we're a product of that, you know. Um, and there's nothing uh, stopping other young pianists to to uh, to dream that to to get there someday. You know, uh, I didn't come from money or I didn't skip any steps i just worked really hard had some good teachers that's of course i had some bit of luck you know you have you have to have luck of course but uh, you know what i mean it's not i didn't steal this from anyone or you know and bruce didn't and uh, and same thing for jj or, or tony you know mm -hmm. they, they all really worked hard and and i think it's a, it's a nice message for this youngsters you know with talent work and luck you can achieve anything you want I just I totally agree about a uh, big Canadian tradition. Actually, we we all know greatest uh, um, musicians of the past and, and recent days too. Uh, to name a few, uh, Glenn Gould, Mark Andre. Of course, we we, we know you know we, we know many. But uh, I can share with you my my um, memories when when I when I got to uh, when I came to Montreal for the first time. It's a really unique place, I have to admit. It's, it's like nothing else culturally wise because it's very competitive by, by its level, by the level of people around. All uh, uh, my classmates, they now have a great career too. You know, they, they're very accomplished, they're very professional. Um, and at the same time, you don't feel pressure. It's mm. probably the least pressure city I have lived after Vancouver, of course, but Vancouver is for, for different uh, reasons. We have ocean here, so. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it's a very interesting combination of professionalism and relaxation. You know, when everybody know that they're great and they, they just feel very humble, as you said in the very beginning, very humble people, they 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 just do what they what they're gonna do you know they they're not trying to uh fight against each other they're not trying to you know do play games so it's just healthy environment so that's why i asked if you think it's it, it's a trend because we, we know now you are teaching at uh, montreal university henry kramer is teaching at the uh, at, uh, in, also in montreal uh and, and many many other great teachers out there so maybe we are uh Maybe we will have very soon you know, a capital of new, a new, new piano capital for, for, for music, which will be Montreal. Uh, maybe not. We'll see. We'll see. But anyway, um, thank you for sharing your, uh, your memories uh, about uh, Chopin competition. You will be playing, you mentioned you, you, you were you've been invited several times by uh, the Vancouver Chopin Society. And the uh, upcoming weekend, I think on September 25th, you will be playing here again at the Playhouse. May you share with us your general impressions about uh, Vancouver in Hull and how it feels for you to, to come here and play for, uh, for the Vancouver Chopin Society audience. Oh, it's a great time every time. Uh, I was here actually earlier this year uh, with the, my very first time with the VSO in January. And I had to play Chopin one with a with, can you imagine with a KN95 mask? <laughs> yeah, so that was a little brutal. But uh, no, I know Vancouver is a fantastic city um, uh, that I 
I really love being there. Uh, you guys are very lucky to have such mm. amazing nature. I, I remember uh, I love taking the seaplane to go on the islands. I've played on some of the islands, uh, seashells, I think, at some point. And uh, yeah, just the view you get when you come back and you it's see fantastic. the city from above, it's, it's unbelievable. And the people have been so nice. I have many friends over there. Uh, David Fong is now there and Wayne Wang and there's uh, Robert Silverman, a different generation, but I always love seeing him and Jane Coop, of course. And that's a wonderful place. And uh, the audience, uh, the eco society is fantastic. Uh, the audience is always very warm. A lot of people, of course, from the Polish, uh, Polish uh, origin coming to the show. And, and now I'm very happy to present a full Chopin recital this time. Last time I did play some Schumann too. Now it's just Chopin and it's a program I'll be playing a lot um, this um, early, early in the season, uh, especially in, in Japan in December. I'm going there for five recitals. So full Chopin recital. Yeah. That's great. It's definitely not to be missed event. We will be there. Uh, so we will see you there for sure. Speaking of the Chopin music in a whole, and do you have anybody who stands for you as the best interpreter of, of uh, Chopin's music? Yeah, alive or dead? No, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Uh, doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, I would say the, the Dinu Lipati is one of the very best. Interesting. Dinu Lipati uh, is Sonata number no. three is amazing. And his waltzes and the nocturne. So hasn't recorded a lot of it, but what he's recorded is, is I think, uh, the best. And and it's a you know it's a cliche maybe, but Arthur Rubinstein I think is uh, for all the miniatures, especially the mazurkas, mazurkas. and the, mm -hmm. and the, it's, it's so good. Hmm. It's just the perfect rubato, you know. It's like the the rubato that that makes the most sense yet is impossible to imitate, you know. S sense of time, you mean. Yes, yes, it's impeccable, you know, yeah. it's so natural, but it's so unique too, you can you hear him instantly. But so there's many others, of course, Alfred Cortot is very inspiring, uh, Michelangeli can be very inspiring in Chopin, uh, Orvitz, uh, and I mean, in the younger generation, I really like Evgeny Bojanov, the Bulgarian yeah, 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 yeah. 2010, it really inspired me quite a bit in a lot of, especially in the more... Uh, youthful works yeah, like Rondo à la Mazur and things like that it's just that guy so has lo spirit. Lo lots of energy lots of energy, yeah, very, energy very, and very ideas energy. and yeah and sound quality and and, and effects and it's uh yeah it's so much character and and he's he's you know I he's, he loves what he does so much you know he loves music so much and I think that's the best thing you can do as a interpreter you know to show how much you love it how great the music is and he has this gift, you know, like in Chopin and great, the great composers like Chopin and Mozart, there's in one phrase, you can go through four five different emotions in just one phrase. And he's able to, to highlight all of that, those very short shades. And, and he highlights it with his face quite a lot too. <laughs> it's very, very uh, emot emotive like that. Uh, but yeah, so th those are a couple mm. of my... Uh, very favorite pianists. Yeah. Would you uh, uh, mind to name maybe 10 top pianists for you? Well, I Dulupu and uh, Lipati. So that's, we got those two. Uh, then Fleischer, for sure. And, and um, you know, Michelangeli. Uh, there's so many of them. It's hard, it's hard to, uh... you know, I really like this uh, young uh, French pianist, Lucas de Barque. Yes, I like him very much. He's a composer as well. Marc Andre Hamelin, of course. Andre Laplan, you know, it's uh, the list. Is I know, I know. It's it's it's, tri it's tricky. It's tricky because yeah. at, at this point you start to think, oh, if I will name this guy and will not name, you know, I understand. So yeah. I, I promised you some some tricky question. Let's count. That was one <laughs> off. Um, recently, you've got a Juno Award for the best cl classical. Um, album of the year, the chamber uh, in chamber music. What's your secret for the great recording? It's a huge award, and I really congratulate you. What's your secret? How to make the great recording? Oh, I don't know. I, I, I think I'm lucky to, to work with a great team. Uh, I've been working with an Electa for the last seven years or so, and 
think our 10th release or 11th release is coming soon with Andrew One. We, we recorded the three Schumann sonatas. Uh, so that's going to be out uh, in November, I think. Um, uh, uh, the secret well, you have to be prepared, you have to be, uh, but yeah, you can you have to be flexible. Some things that you plan out sometimes when you listen to it, it's not as good as you, you hope to be. And you have to trust your uh, direct or your engineer. Mm -hmm. I work with the same person in my, all my cities, Carl Talbot, and he has a very good ear. Yeah, I studied piano when he was younger too. And oh. so he knows what I like and he knows what I what it is I want to, to, to do. Um, so he's very, and so I have to trust him because at some point when you have you do so many takes, so many versions, you sort of lose touch with what is good, what's the best. So you have to trust uh, someone for, uh, from the outside sometimes. Um, and uh, also record yourself before going to the session. You know, if the, if that's the first time you hear yourself play that, and it's at the recording, it's. <laughs> It might be you might be in for a terrible surprise. So everyone has a phone. So I just record mm -hmm. yourself on the, your phone. I do it all the time when I prepare for stuff. Even when I do rehearsal with orchestras, I'll leave my phone on the floor, record, voice memo, and mm -hmm. in the hotel room just listen to it, see what works, what doesn't work. And this way, you don't live in the in La La Land where you just just read your good reviews and you think you're the best. No, you you live in the real world. You listen to what you do. And you're not perfect. Some things are not as good, but it always gives you room to improve. And mm -hmm. you know, I, I I said that the other day. Um, you know, playing a concert and everything is going great. It's a great feeling, but you learn nothing. <laughs> you know, the next morning, you, there's you learn you didn't learn anything. And if a bad concert or a concert, for, you know, some moments didn't go as well, then you really know what to practice the next morning. <laughs> I understand. You know? Do you have any preferences on on your piano? Do you select your instrument for recording? Uh, I try to, uh, but it's uh, unfortunately uh, in Canada we're not, uh, <laughs> I guess, the first market in terms of pianos. You know, I think companies like Yamaha or Steinway, their best instruments are you know in Europe or Asia or or the States even. So in Canada, we're maybe not the first priority in terms of market. You know, mm -hmm. so we yeah, there's some piano, good pianos and things are fairly recent. In the last few years, there's a new piano in the Orpheum that I played, which is quite good. There's a new piano. Uh... So all this to say that we don't. There's not a big, large pool of amazing Hamburg Steinways like there would be in Berlin mm -hmm. or something. Uh, so the ones I know in Quebec are in the good pianos tend to be in the halls. Already the pianos in the halls. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also yeah, those, those are good, very good. There's the one in uh, Damien Forger or Palais mm -hmm. in Quebec City. And, uh, but I think most importantly is a piano technician. Because even with a subpar piano or a piano that has some problems, if you have a really good technician, you can get a lot of good things done. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I try to work with the, with Marcel Lapointe, who is a fantastic technician from, Quebec, uh, technician from Quebec City. So my, my, my question was also about like, how easy you um you are on, on on the piano or you're very hard person because if, if the the piano is, is is not prepared the way i i need i just know that it, it's not going to work because i will think about other things uh how do you handle do you need to handle such things when you record or you really can set things up as you as you wish uh, most yeah i mean i I, I've had the chance to play on such amazing instruments that it's hard to find that same kind of amazing quality here in Canada, to be honest, you know, but with a good technician, you can find something close to that, you know, mm -hmm. to, to the sound and the evenness and the touch you want. But uh, there's some compromise to be made for sure, you know, because I'm not recording. I mean, ideally, every recording would be done in an amazing, you know, 2000 seat acoustic and with a piano that's you know maybe just three years old or something like that has been played enough has opened up but it yeah, still yeah, has this yeah. new shine mm -hmm. you know but this is not the case I, i'm not and you know i i'm lucky enough just to be making recordings which is you know today there's no money to be made from them you know and mm -hmm. i saw this change even in my early and i started in 2015 but even then i was selling physical copies quite a bit 
and I see what's streaming and every year like the physical copy is not selling and yeah, as we know streaming revenue is not much you know compared to, mm-hmm. to that so so I just feel grateful to be making the recordings I'm, I, I'm making and even if the conditions are maybe sometimes sometimes they're not as ideal as they would be for Mark Targarich or Pauline or something you just have to be grateful for the, the experience mm-hmm. and the editing process is fantastic I really like for instance, the Chopin concerto recording that I did with the Montreal Symphony in Nagano, you know, uh, sometimes in one phrase, you know, you can cut from Thursday to Friday to f- Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> and no one can tell. And it's, yeah. it's just brilliant. And this way you can have a, I guess, an ideal version of, of what it is you want to do. But it's also sets a bar that's not very rela- realistic for, for students and for even professionals alike. That's another subject, but yeah, I understand, I understand what, what you mean. I just remember you were saying about making edits. Now imagine how Glenn Gould, so they have to make all these edits by cutting the, the tape. Uh, well, you touched the, the base about, uh, about um, teaching, and um, I didn't expect you to to start teaching. Why? Why it happened? Why? Why? Why decided? Well, I was approached by the, the Montreal University actually to be a guest, uh, to, to be teaching at their school. And uh, as a guest teacher, uh, you, can, you can have as many or as few students as you want. Mm. So it's a very flexible thing. I so, see. Uh, and I was asked just before the pandemic hit, I accepted just before the pandemic hit. So, so I did some online teaching. I started my, my time there uh, online. <laughs> A student of mine was even in Australia when I was there. So, uh, but yeah, there's some good work. I mean, as you know, you must have done a lot of Zoom teaching, and uh, with good students and good equipment, there's good, some very good work that can be done still. So, if it's combined with from time to time seeing each other in person, it works perfectly, in my opinion. Mm. Uh, yeah. So I was because I was thinking, if you have so many concerts, so you 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 have to be how your daily routine looks like. You you must be practicing uh, quite a bit of. Hours. Well, for instance, I started my first day a few days ago, and mm-hmm. I teach about five hours every two weeks. So I go there, I have three half students, mm-hmm. three students who study with also with Henry. So I, I see, see Henry one week, they see me the other week, and one full time. So instead of seeing him every week, I see him for two hours every two weeks. Uh, so a big, I larger see. lesson this way. And mm-hmm. uh, so far, so good. I mean, I'm, tr- uh, you know, it's easier. I mean, just five. It's not a lot of. Uh, it's not a big engagement. Just five hours every two weeks. You know, I can manage to find that in my schedule, and I really like the experience. I do enjoy it. It's a uh, less less stressful than than uh, concerts. <laughs> but my day to day, yes, I mean a day like uh, today, which I didn't have anything else to do but this interview. I can practice up, you know, six seven hours easily, mm-hmm. uh, especially when I'm n- learning new music. Uh, I tend to practice a lot, uh, but for instance, tomorrow is the day before recital. I'm every recital Saturday, so I I'll get back into my recital rep. Uh, but yeah, the day of a concert, I might practice just two or three hours maximum. You know, to keep mm-hmm. uh, not even three, just two, just the, and I'll try not to practice anything else than what I'm playing in the evening. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's impossible, but uh, when you can't. Because otherwise, I feel like I have too many notes in my head and too, too, many, too many different styles, you know? Yeah. Like, if, if I play a Mozart concerto in the evening, if I practice Prokofiev second in the afternoon, it's just all my, my energy will be at the right I bet. place, you know? I, I bet. Yeah. I bet. It's, it's very, it's very <laughs> bizarre. Different worlds. Yeah, yeah, very <laughs> different worlds, definitely. Yeah. Uh, so I see. Okay, so you, you're in a more relaxed schedule uh, for, for teaching. Uh, because I thought, like, if you if you join the the faculty for the full full time, no, 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 it's, I it's impossible. A, yeah, you know, yeah, so, it's impossible. Yeah. yeah, I see. What do you think about uh, the modern uh, pianism in general and whole? And um, do you think the level goes up or down? Uh, it goes up and down, I guess. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, there's many, many young voices that inspire me. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. like uh, like I said, like Luca de Barc, uh, Lucas Ganyushas, Bojanov, uh, even the younger uh, 
who just this young Korean guy who just went library and was Believe, yeah, all, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Young Chan Lim, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And Sang Jin Cho, of course, and uh, Bruce and Trifonov and Beatrice Irana and you know, you know, there's a very great variety of voices and what I like maybe is nowadays that there's no more of these uh, schools of playing like there used to be a hundred years ago a very typical French school American school Russian school as you know and, and now it's everyone you know a Korean is studying in Hanover Germany from a Russian teacher <laughs> you see so it's all over the place and in a way it's good I mean I think it people's own personalities maybe are more brought to the front this way mm -hmm. that they're not pass through a filter of this French school, French or American school or whatever. Yeah. So uh, I, I think, uh, I think uh, maybe if you want to find interesting playing, this seems to be maybe more of it in the older recordings, maybe where uh, they didn't bother too much with per technical perfection. But that's what I meant by, I think the era of recordings and CDs have created this expectation. Uh, that that's what we need to do at all times, even though it's heavily edited. Uh, mm -hmm. In this way, that takes the focus away from the essential, which is the the, the music message and and spontaneity and you know. So, to close our conversation, I would like to ask you. Uh, you seem like a very kind, humble, and modest man. In which occasion it's possible to find uh charlotte richard amlin drunk in the bar and oh yeah <laughs> well you know i have to say uh, a beer after a concert is is always better than <laughs> any other time you know it just tastes better it feels better and so when i have something like 80 concerts a year uh I try to leave the drinking to after the concert, so otherwise I would drink every day, you know. <laughs> so that would not be good for me. But no, I, uh, you know, I, I actually uh, that's a whole new ch other chapter. But when I was younger, I was I played keyboards in a bunch of bands and stuff like that. So I, I remember playing in bars and having that kind of life too, which was and playing for people of my age, which was really nice. And as we know, classical music, it's a lot of it, you know, mostly older people, but. Not always the case everywhere, like in Korea, it's a lot of young people, actually. So, so that, that's a. Uh, but I, I try. I hope I'm not too boring in life. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, how do you think uh, then the new award from from Juno might be a good reason to drink? Uh well, it's not new anymore. It's been a few. Uh, it's been a while now, <laughs> but yeah, it's nice. I haven't gotten the trophy yet, but uh, maybe when I'll get it by mail, I'll be uh, well. I'll be I happy. I really wish you to to have it, and I wish you many many awards in your life. And I would like to thank you for this great conversation. Thanks again. Thanks, Ilya. All the very best. See you soon. Me too. Yeah. See you soon.